Okay, so Hare Krishna, everyone. We are live on Facebook. Um, my name is Balanamai Das, and I'm very fortunate to be here today with His Holiness Bhakti Rasamrita Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj, welcome. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Um, so today uh, we're having a, a live interactive session. So it's going to be a question and answer session. If you want to leave any questions for us, we invite you to please uh, leave a comment on this video. And uh, we will, we've got about an hour's, hour's session here today. So if you want to leave any um, questions for Maharaj, you can do so in the comments and we'll relay as many as we can in that time to Maharaj during that time. Um, so this is a great time. If you've got any questions, any spiritual doubts, any kind of dilemmas that you're going through or anything you want to have clarified, this is a great opportunity to, to get your questions over. Um, so yeah, we've, um, we know Maharaj here in the UK is a very kind of uniting force amongst all of us here. We, he's spent so much time being very personal, answering our questions and um, helping us in so many ways. And now he's doing the same thing online. Uh, so Maharaj, we're very happy to, to be with you today. Um, we've had quite a few questions in already uh, before the session. We're gonna have them coming in as we, as we speak. Um, but if it's okay with you, Maharaj, we'll just dive straight into the first question. Yes, yes, sure. Okay. So the first question, um, something many of us can probably relate to, is about instability in, uh, in our spiritual practice. So this is from uh, Shreyas Bhatia. And they say, um, when we are practicing bhakti, sometimes we get very enthusiastic, i.e. we wake up at 4.30 in the morning, chant our japa um, for about a month or so. And then after some time, there's a stagnation period, um, comes and goes, and we leave our japa thinking that we're not made for bhakti. Um, and we start to think about leaving Krishna consciousness and do something in material life. So Maharaj, please could you help in this situation? Well, this um, oscillation or fluctuation from enthusiasm to lack of enthusiasm is natural when one takes to Krishna consciousness because it is a characteristic of the conditioned mind. So uh, one should not get discouraged by that. One should continue one's practices sincerely, uh, not heeding the urgings of the mind. And if one really feels deflated or one feels lack of enthusiasm, then one can associate more with devotees to hear and chant in their association. And with such hearing and chanting, then one will get one's energy and enthusiasm back again. So it is very important that a hearing and chanting in the association of devotees uh, is done. And then we will get our energy back. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay. <laughs> Next question we have is uh, it's an interesting one. It's, uh, it's based on uh, a, a purport of the Bhagavatam of the first canto. And this is a purport where Srila Prabhupada is talking about the different rasas, the different relationships that living entity has with Krishna. And um, this person is asking, when a person dies, we immediately burn the body and consequently we don't have any attraction for that body. Nobody loves a dead body. Why then are we attracted to some other form of dead matter like cars, houses, phones, etc.? At least with a human, we can have the perverted rasa. But with the dead matter, which rasa is acting in, in that way? What causes us to run after the, the dead material things? That is the perverted shanta rasa, the perverted rasa of neutrality. The relationships with human beings or living entities can be in the other four rasas. But the relationship that we have with objects uh, and uh, devices and so on, that's a perverted form of the mode of or the rasa of neutrality. So that is when in the perverted form, we utilize it for some benefit. You see, we find the 
attachment or attraction to a car or a house only because it has some utility for us. The moment the car is smashed in an accident or the house is no longer functional, then we're not attracted to the house anymore. So similarly, we are not attracted to a dead body because the dead body cannot do anything now for us in the future. It is of no value to us anymore. It was when the person was alive. So therefore, the, the, the foundation of relationships here in this material world is utility. What can I get from this relationship? And that is a selfish mentality which causes our existence in the material world in the first place. So when we develop the selfless relationship with Krishna of trying to serve him and everything connected to him, then we get rectified of this selfish mentality and we look at everything from the point of view of service rather than from the point of view of what can I get out of this? And if at all we're looking at things from a utility point of view, it is going to be uh, in the context of service to Krishna. So will this be useful to me in Krishna's service? Right, it almost seems like that Shanta Ras is stronger than the other Rasas. Like for example, if somebody crashes their car, like you mentioned, then they would be more attached to the car than the person who crashed into it. They would start shouting at that person. So is that, is that something also to do with the material mentality that we would value the object more than the person? Well, it's an extension of the false ego. Mm. Mm. So, janasya moho yam aham mameti. So the moha or the illusion of aham and mama. Aham means I, mama means mine. So, uh, it's not just about my body, but the extensions of my body, which means the things that I consider to belong to me, like my car. Because I think the car is of so much value. It gives me utility value. It gives me prestige. It gives me convenience. So when something happens to the car, someone else knocks into the car, then I feel angry with the person who has interfered with my convenience. Mm. So that is what happens. So we see that person as an invader, someone who has created a nuisance or a disturbance in our life. So, uh, and also another fact is that in the modern day and age, we attach more important to objects than we do to people. And sometimes it may be animals like cats and dogs that we may, or pets that we may give more importance to. Uh, one reason for that is that we have dysfunctional relationships with humans. It's so hard to find humans with whom you can get along nicely for any length of time. Uh, so then we take refuge in, in living entities of a lower nature that will be always loyal to us, that will always love us. There won't be any problem with them. And even apart from that, we go to objects like devices and technology and take shelter in that. So it is an indication of how far we have gone away from uh, very smooth, loving relationships with human beings. Very nice answer. Thank you, Marge. Um, we have another question from Shreya. Um, she's asking, what will happen at the end of Kali Yuga? Will there be any devotees present on this planet? Except the Supreme Lord, uh, there won't be anyone left, hardly. If at all there's anybody, there'll only be very, very few. But Srila Prabhupada explains that this Hare Krishna movement uh, will last for about 10,000 years in Kali Yuga. And after that, there will hardly be any devotees left. So whatever devotee, whatever few there are who remain will um, mostly be 
um, not available or not visible. There will be the great sages who are in hiding who will continue the parampara in the next Satya Yuga to come. But they will not be visible like they are now. There will be very, very few, if at all, at the end of Kali Yuga. So there will be no semblance left of Krishna consciousness and therefore there will be no other way left for the Supreme Lord than to descend and destroy. Kalki Avatar, as Srila Prabhupada explains, has only one objective, to kill. He kills the evildoers because there is, a, there is an abundance of them in, in, uh, by the time Kali Yuga comes to a close. It's almost all, all of them almost are going to be like that. Um, and we see that we see the start of it, I guess, now, Maharaj, right? Even though it's the golden age period, it seems to be the start. We can still see the start of that, that, that period taking place. Yes. In this Kali Yuga, which spans about 432,000 years, we are now in what is called the Sandhya, or the, uh, the period which is the interface between the previous Yuga and this one. And... Also, it happens to be the golden age because uh, it is the age that has begun with the advent of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his Sankirtan movement. So the golden age will continue for 10,000 years. The Hare Krishna movement, the path of devotional service to Krishna will continue till that time. And then it will no longer exist in any substantial way. So we should oh, take that advantage. Kind of leads on to our next question, actually. Oh, sorry, Marcy. Okay. Yeah, so we should take advantage of this golden age. Mm. I was going to say that that links quite nicely onto our next question. Um, when you just said about the um, the devotion being completely lost. So the next question is about <clears throat> this is from Keshav Gopal Das, and he says, "Why did Vedic, why does or why did Vedic culture decline?" despite being so great and powerful in its philosophy? One reason is that it is the current of time. It is the arrangement of the Supreme Lord. So it has declined by divine arrangement. The four yugas, <clears throat> Satya, Treta, Dvapar and uh, Kali, progressively see a decline in uh, all aspects of uh, divine Vedic culture. And there is a gradual rise of the demoniac forces and natures. So by the time, uh, so Kali Yuga is especially the age of quarrel when Dharma has come down uh, to its very lowest as far as the four Yugas are concerned. And as Kali Yuga progresses, it will decline further and further till the end of Kali Yuga when it becomes so bad that Kalki Avatar will come. So <clears throat> the answer is that it is the arrangement because that's how it's supposed to be with time. So the question may be asked that why does it have to be like that? Why can't it just be a Satya Yuga? Why can't you know it just continue like that? And the answer is that this is the material world and we are not meant to be here. If it was always to be the Satya Yoga when everybody is virtuous and devotional, then this will be the spiritual world. So there would no, be no need for the material world. But there is a need for the material world because there are living entities like us who have rebelled against the idea of serving the Supreme Personality of Godhead and therefore the material world has been made especially for us. And it is designed in such a way that we learn a lesson through all the suffering that we undergo here, that this is not our real home and that we have to be in the service of Krishna in the spiritual world. So if it wasn't for this decline in everything, which is a characteristic of the material world where everything degenerates, everything deteriorates with time, then we would not have had any idea of any spiritual life. 
even as it is with all the suffering, most people in the world have no inclination for spiritual life. They have no idea or understanding that there is anything beyond it. They don't have any idea why there is suffering in the material world. So imagine if there was very little suffering, why would anybody want to go back to the spiritual world? They'll say, this is good. Even now people say that, despite being in, uh, in a suffering condition. So therefore, this is an arrangement of Lord Krishna. The material world is constantly changing. And this is one of the elements in that progressive or regressive change as it happens from Satya all the way to Kali. And then again, there is a cataclysmic change and then you have Satya Yuga again and the cycles repeat. So in the material world, everything is cyclical as we read in the Bhagavad Gita. In a cycle, it means that something starts and it goes up and goes down and goes up and down. So that's why you have this change from Satya Yuga coming down to Kali and again up to Satya and so on. Um, that makes sense, Maharaj, but I just wanted to, to question one thing because it seems like we hear that Krishna's philosophy is non different from Krishna. We hear that Krishna's prasadam is non different from Krishna. All things connected with Krishna are non-different from him. So it seems that something connected to Krishna would be eternal in, in nature. Is that not the, is not, not the case with um, his philosophy, for example? So you, you're asking because nature is also part of Krishna. So mm -hmm. that's also eternal? I guess it, when we hear it is in, in, the, the, uh, in one form, isn't it? Nature is always, is always there, but it just takes different shapes. Yeah, nature is eternal, but the forms that material nature take takes, or, or the forms that material nature takes is is uh, changing, ever changing. You know, in the Bhagavad Gita, there are five uh, topics that are discussed: Ishvara, that is the supreme Lord; Jiva, the spirit soul; then there is uh, time, Akala. There is Prakriti, which is material nature. And finally, there is Karma. So of all of these, only Karma is not eternal. The first four, including material nature, are eternal. So material nature is eternal, but the forms that she takes are not eternal. They are ever-changing. So we can understand that uh, by a simple example that Srila Prabhupada gives in his purports in the Bhagavatam and Chaitanya Charitamrita. Imagine there is a potter with mud and a potter's wheel. And the uh, potter takes the mud, mixes it with water, and then makes a pot. Then after some time, and the pot has been ready, it's been used for a while, and it starts leaking, and it's not functional anymore. Then he breaks down that pot into bits and pieces, crushes it and mixes it back in the mud because it's mud actually. So he just mixes it back in the mud and from the stock of mud that he has, he again fashions more pots. So the mud represents material nature. The potter represents the Supreme Lord and the pots which are created and break and created and they are broken they represent the different forms that material nature takes. Imagine, isn't it that the, um, the Advaita school would use this as an example of how the soul is one with God, that the pots can become broken and then merge with the original? How, how would we ref refute that, that statement? The pots refer to the material body. So the material elements that constitute the body and constitute everything in the material world eventually will disintegrate and in their primal form, they will go back to their universal source from where they originated. Whereas the spiritual spark that animates the different material bodies, uh, they will continue existing. And even at the time of universal destruction, they will reside in the Supreme Lord. 
And those who have not got liberated will get an opportunity to continue their life in the material world when the next creation begins. That's how the cycle goes on. So it is not the Maya. The Mayavad conception is that when the Ghatakash, uh, Patakash, you know, the idea that when the pot has some air inside it, when you break the pot, then the air within the pot just mixes with the air outside. So it's all one. Okay. Mm. But there is a difference here. The difference being that the individual soul within the material body has a distinct identity and an existence. It is spiritual energy, but it is a distinct spark of spiritual energy. Right? And it retains its individual existence. And it does not lose its existence and individuality by merging into some spiritual light. Even for those on the path of Jnana Yoga, uh, who wish that their soul will merge into the impersonal light and they may succeed in that objective, but uh, the soul still remains there, suspended in that impersonal spiritual light, the Brahma Jyoti. It, its existence and individuality do not get extinguished. Srila Prabhupada gives the example of a green parrot entering into a green tree. It may appear that the parrot has merged into the tree, but inside the tree, the parrot retains its individual existence. Thank you, Raj. I have more questions on this, but I want to give our viewers a chance to, to, um, to speak. So I'm just going to continue if that's okay with the questions. Yes. Um, we have one from, from Vani, and um, who says, how can we decide <clears throat> who to choose as our Diksha Guru or our spiritual master? Well, first of all, um, in, a, in a general philosophical sense, we must see that he is uh, attached to his, uh, a bona fide disciplic succession. So that is a given factor. So, and since we assume that everybody here on this call are devotees of ISKCON, then they will uh, want to be associated with personalities who are attached to this particular branch of the Gaudiya Vaishnava Sampradaya. So they follow the rules and principles of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. So then there are, um, by, by the structures, the, the management structure, the authority structures in ISKCON, certain uh, individuals uh, are authorized to, to initiate devotees. So from amongst those who are so authorized, uh, one can select somebody depending on one's own individual um, choice. It's basically a very personal choice. It's a question of uh, where one gets inspiration from, where one feels encouraged to take shelter, to get, to get initiated. And different people will have different criteria for that. So it, one cannot give a general answer. But the only general point that can be made is that it's a very personal decision depending on where each person feels inspired. Given that they are within this regulated structure of our institution. Marj, you mentioned ISKCON. Someone's actually asked a question about, <clears throat> so ISKCON is the, the institution that we're connected to through Shura Prabhupada, but is it possible to go back to Godhead without being part of that particular institution, like chanting 16 rounds, following principles that we have? Is it possible to go back to Godhead without doing those specific things? You mean, is the question that, is it possible to go back to Godhead without being connected to the institution of ISKCON? Or is the question that, is it possible to go back to Godhead without following the teachings of ISKCON? I think it's more about the institution and if it's possible to follow another path mm. and still go back to Godhead. Well, for one thing, without following the teachings, it is certainly not possible to go back to Godhead right? 
Now, those teachings are essentially the teachings of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, teachings of Sri Krishna, teachings of the six Goswamis, which have been coming down in the disciplic succession. So, the Prabhupada is our, is our founder Acharya for his Khan, and he has presented this knowledge in a way that people of the modern age can understand easily. And he's also created an institution which facilitates effectively the attainment of that ultimate objective of love of God. So number one, one must follow the teachings. And number two, since one is associated with the institution, one has gained so much from it, one has learned so much from it, one is dependent on the association of devotees and the facilities that are afforded by the institution, one should try to remain connected to the institution. That is what Srila Prabhupada wanted. So one should remain part of the ISKCON movement uh, in letter and in spirit and follow the teaching sincerely. And then one can go back to Godhead. The question also implies that if we are not a part of the ISKCON institution, but we are following the Krishna conscious philosophy properly, then can we go back to Godhead? The answer is yes. If you're connected to a bona fide Vaishnava spiritual master and you follow those teachings, those bona fide teachings carefully, properly, uh, then yes, you can go back also. It would be rather presumptuous for us to say that it's only from our institution that people can become pure devotees and no other institution can they become pure devotees. That would be uh, too much to say. Uh, although things become very easy when you join an institution like ISKCON, because all the facilities are given here. But in principle, if there are other bona fide Vaishnavas outside of the institution, and there are some devotees who have taken shelter and they're doing everything right, then there is no reason why they shouldn't also attain uh, the perfection of life. Yes, good to, good to hear. It's not sectarian. But at the same time, since we are here, we're all ISKCON devotees here in this conference, I presume, uh, then I would encourage everybody to remain within the ISKCON society and do uh, your Krishna conscious activities. And even if they're not in the society, we can encourage them to come and join because this is such a wonderful movement. It's something where Srila Prabhupada has given us certain perspectives uh, on, on Krishna conscious philosophy and its application in the modern times. Therefore, it becomes really wonderful and easy. So we encourage everybody to join and to continue on and not leave despite any obstacles and problems that may come. Nice, Maharaj. We have another question related to spiritual masters just come in. This is from Anand. Uh, he says, um, how do we know when our spiritual master is testing us and when he is instructing us? Well, that really depends on the particular circumstances, what exactly the instructions are, what exactly is the situation, um, the relationship between the disciple and the spiritual master. So uh, one should have the wisdom and the intelligence to judge this to judge the difference. And that will come the idea of him giving an instruction, but he doesn't intend you to follow that instruction. That will be very rare, I suppose. The idea that there are two options. One is that he gives an instruction. The other is that he's testing you. What's implied in this question is that in the test, there is an instruction that the spiritual master does not actually want you to follow. And therefore, he's testing you. But that, I suppose, will be very, very rare. So I don't think such things happen, you know, commonly. So it is better to just simply follow the instructions that are being told. And if in exceptional cases there is such, if there is some instance like that, then, then one needs that wisdom and intelligence to understand this, that one may clarify it with the spiritual master himself or maybe with other senior devotees. So we get some insights into the matter. Okay. 
Um, we've had a few different questions come in about <clears throat> balance and spiritual life. So I'm just going to condense them um, into one. Um, so really the question is how to balance our spiritual service and our material duties. That's from Muskan and, and Vishnu Palai. And also specifically Vedant wants to know how do we balance spiritual life and our, and our studies and student life. What was the first one? The first one is to how to balance our spiritual service and our material duties. Mm. Um, I guess it's things like um, grahasta life or, or different work duties. And then specifically how to balance spiritual life with um, student life as well. And so there's another, another extra bit on this question, which is, and, and when we're doing that, how do we avoid prajalpa um, without offending others who aren't devotees? I think the implication there is that if you'd if you'd have if you do get involved in material duties, then you will have to do prajalpa in order to not offend people in the material world. That's that's what I'm getting from that. Okay. Well, balance is required everywhere in life. Even if one is in material life and there is no semblance of spiritual life in that person, in the activities, still that person would require to balance his life because there are always competing demands on one's time and energies. When we are living in the material world where time is and space are constraints. So balance is a skill, is an art that we all have to cultivate and learn. That's the first point. And the second point is that we have to prioritize our um, activities, you know, and according to the priority that we assign to each task, then we will allot uh, how much time we're going to spend for it, according to its need. And the need is according to the priority. Number three, another consideration is that there are certain things that are required to be done at a certain time. And we can't change that. For example, if you are a student, then you have to be in the class at a certain time. If you are a professional going to work, then you have to be at your place of work at a certain time. You can't change that. So then you have to adjust according to that. But apart from all the time that you spend at work and at study at university or wherever you are, uh, there is time that is available to one, oneself. And one should utilize that wisely for one's spiritual activities and for um, other responsibilities that we have at home or for our health and so on. So it's a question of judicious planning and execution with proper prioritization giving the focus on our Krishna consciousness and then adjusting our life in such a way that the spiritual and the material are organized properly. So we try to do our chanting as much as we can in the morning and then we um, do some hearing perhaps, then we get ready, we go for work or go for our studies or something. Then we come back, we may have some chores to do. So we do all that. So we manage our time. We have 24 hours. How much time do I need for sleep? How much do I need for food? How much do I need for, you know, uh, travel and so on and so forth. We should plan it out nicely. Yes, and Prajalpa, well, the Prajalpa part of the question that yeah. that is always there, even in the association of devotees, it's a great temptation to gossip. So one has to, by one's spiritual intelligence, avoid doing that. One should discuss only that which is helpful or, or necessary for our Krishna consciousness and for our service. And avoid uh, not just that prajalpa, but also devotees who do that prajalpa. If you think that there are some people who are especially um, shall we say, keen on doing that kind of prajalpa. And every time one comes in their association, one also gets influenced and better to keep away. Mm. 
Maharaj, you had a couple of um, questions come in about the application of Krishna consciousness in work life as well. So it's a similar, similar topic. Um, I'll just read this out. So we say that Krishna sees the effort and not the result primarily. Uh, but in the material world, in the corporate world especially, it is always a result that matters. Our efforts aren't recognized if we do not produce results. How can we understand this and how can we implement the philosophy of recognizing effort and not results? How can organizations design their performance management system as per this philosophy? Is that even possible? That's from Nirat Shet. That is one of the problems associated with mode of passion activities. The mode of culture economics, where disproportionate emphasis is being placed on results. Now, in this whole dilemma between effort and results, it is not that results are not important at all. The results are kept in mind and the effort is done accordingly. Otherwise, uh, it's pointless. For example, if there is a student who goes to university, then he or she has to study, attend classes with the idea, with the objective of learning the subjects well, and also eventually getting that degree successfully. So there is an objective. It is with that objective that one puts in effort. Similarly, even when Arjuna was um, fighting the battle of Kurukshetra, which he was not inclined to do at the beginning, he put his heart and soul into the battle. Even though Krishna told him, Nimitta Matra Bhava Sabhya just become my instrument and fight, you know, he uh, didn't tell him, as Prabhupada says in one lecture, that I have defeated the Kaurava army anyway, so all you have to do is just sleep and I'll do the needful. He didn't say that. He said, you have to fight, even though I'm the one who's going to do it. So effort is very important, but Arjuna fought in such a way that he planned his battle. He planned who he was going to attack, how he was going to maneuver as a chariot, Krishna was simply following the instructions of Arjuna on the battlefield. When Arjuna said, move left, he would move left. When Arjuna said, go fast, he would go fast. Stop, he would stop. So Arjuna was masterminding the tactical decisions on the field. So he was putting all his effort in, but he was also planning. He was acting in a way that would normally hope to get the desired result. So not only must we put effort, but we must also plan our effort and do it in a way that we think is the best possible course to attain the objective. And the third is the ultimate result. So there's not just effort and the result. There's the middle point, which is how we put our effort in, how we plan it. So the how of the effort is related to the objective. We plan our activities in such a way that we hope the results will be achieved. Now, ultimately the results being achieved are not only in our hands, they're in Krishna's hands. Sometimes we are successful and sometimes we are not. So it is true that in the outside world, in corporations, etc. Overemphasis is given on results. And if you don't get the results, then you're fired. And in some places, they don't even mind how you get the results so long as you do it. Therefore, such mode of passion economic activity is not sustainable. And because it's in the mode of passion, by definition, according to Bhagavad Gita, it becomes a source of grief for everybody involved. It is an unsustainable model, a model that only focuses on uh, attaining some results, which first of all may be an exaggerated result, uh, and one has to attain that by hook or by crook. 
that will cause uh, disruption in the social fabric. It will cause uh, dysfunctionality in, in the social fiber everywhere. People are not going to be satisfied with this kind of stress and this kind of pressure. At the same time, it doesn't mean that, uh, you know, somebody is not producing results, then um, we will do nothing about it. Maybe what, that, what, what it means is that this person uh, either has some difficulties, some obstacles, and we have to see what uh, we can do to facilitate that. If you don't give a person what uh, he needs to do a job to attain, the, to get the results, and then you blame him for that, that's not going to work. So you have to ensure that the person is sufficiently trained, sufficiently empowered, sufficiently encouraged to do what he needs to do. And ultimately, after all that, then we have to also see the environment, the circumstances. Despite the good training, despite the good encouragement and everything, it may be that the circumstances are just overwhelming. For example, COVID happened as an unforeseen thing and many businesses uh, could not succeed. They made losses, many businesses. So you can't blame a person for that. Right, So some consideration has to be given for that. And finally, the consideration of whether that person is the right person to do that kind of work has to be also examined. So if one has taken a care of the first two points, then we have to see the third one. Or actually that has to be seen from the very beginning, even before you give them that work. But because we are, uh, we are not Krishna, we, our, our ability to foresee is limited. So we may select a wrong person for a, for a certain kind of work, or we may be constrained to, to ask somebody to do a certain kind of work. Um, so therefore, uh, we may find out that it needs some course correction. And then in that case, maybe yes, we can move that person on and that person can be requested to do something else. We do that in our temples as well, all the time. What to speak of the corporate world, even in the temple. You know, if someone's doing a certain service, we have to consider all these three aspects. So suppose there's a, a, anyone doing any service, you know, randomly, whatever be that service, let's say a head pujari or a head cook or something like that, yes? And he is given all the facilities, he is given all the encouragement, all the training, and the circumstances are favorable, but still he ends up burning the dal every time. He ends up, you know, just cooking things which are not really good. Then time comes to change him. You have to have somebody else doing that service. But it's our responsibility that if I've selected a person to be in the kitchen or in the DT department, or to, for any other service for that matter, then if I am the authority responsible for it, I should have ensured that I've selected the person with the right attitude, with the right abilities, and then given that person the right kind of atmosphere and training and encouragement. And then if after all of that, the person is not delivering, then yes, we may ask him to do something else. We'll say, okay, maybe you should try this service. So at least this is done in a mode of goodness kind of manner. And so we balance out the needs for results as well. So remember that in practical living, the results are also important. Even in our Krishna consciousness movement, results are important. Although it's not everything. Because usually when all these three factors are there, then uh, the results will come. And of course, in Bhagavad Gita, in the, uh, we also learn of the five factors for the success of any uh, accomplishment or any action, right? So we won't go into that, it'll be too long. Okay, so I hope that answers the question. So corporate corporates are essentially capitalistic organizations. And when the, that form of capitalism is driven by greed and passion and anger and lust and so on, then these are the problems that result. 
However, if we have a, a, a capitalism that is based on uh, some valid dharmic principles, uh, not merely on greed and, and the mode of passion in general, uh, then the outcomes uh, will be much better. But even in such a business, remember, even if it's a mode of, you know, some degree of passion is essential in any business endeavor. Okay, otherwise you can't run a business. Yes. Um, still, we have to uh, have an eye on the result. Because if your business does not yield profits, then uh, you can't survive as a business. So you have to see where you went wrong and go back. Your feedback loop must be the, must exist, which makes you understand why we have made a loss. Then you have to analyze that. So this is the fourth point that I'd like to say, the, the feedback loop and analyzing why the results haven't come and then taking an appropriate action. Okay, I think I spoke too much on that one. It's, uh, oh, it's a good question and a good answer, I think. It's, it seems like results are an unavoidable part of the process. You can't really get away from results. Yes. They are one of many factors. Yes. Hmm. The that's question really, is, if the results are not achieved, what are we doing about it? Say, I, I'm sitting to chant my japa, and I want to chant good japa, but I have the habit of falling asleep the moment I sit down for japa or within a few moments. So can I say, well, my effort is there, I'm, I'm sitting down to chant, but then I fall asleep, that's the result. I don't get the results, the result is the Krishna's hands. It's kind of so, result, but... Yeah, so the danger with that idea that we, you know, it's a misapplication or misunderstanding of the idea that we should only put in the effort and not be concerned about the result. So if the result is like this, that I'm falling asleep in my japa, then I have to analyze. What am I doing wrong? Because the result isn't coming. So then I have to see what I need to do. I should consult with devotees. I should see where things are going wrong. So that the good result of my chanting, my effort will come, which is that I will chant attentively and devotedly. Right? So I've taken this question that relates to the corporate realm and also tried to give an answer that can be related to our devotional activities directly. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Marish, for that. Um, I've got one more question here on, the, on a kind of a corporate angle. Um, it's about women in the workplace, so it's a bit of a one of those to topics uh, It's kind of much discussed. Um, she says, this is from Somya. <clears throat> she says, in the first canto of the Bhagavatam, it is described that shyness is a, a gift of women. It's a gift give, um, that's, that's um, yeah, it's, it's symbolic of women. So how can this be applied to a working woman's life? And how is that practically ap applicable in a workplace? Well, that principle is always valid in any sphere of life, including the workplace. So that has to be ensured. Uh, nowadays, that principle is not much appreciated in the modern world. There's that feeling that you have to, you have to be unshy to get ahead. Yeah, well, um, well, one has to know where to draw one's lines. That, that is the essential point. The principle is still valid. Thank you, Maurice. Um, I'll move on because we've only got uh, I think 10 minutes left, so we've just got quite a few questions still to come. Um, we've got a few questions on uh, Krishna, which is nice. Um, does the emotion of hate come from Krishna? This is like um, a question we've got. So qualitatively, it's said that we are equal to Krishna, um, but sometimes we tend to express experience hatred. Does that mean that Krishna also has this emotion of hatred? If that is so, why is that? And who does Krishna hate? Because the Sastra says that 
Krishna loves everybody. How do we comprehend, how do we comprehend this contradiction? That's from Sri Radha Priya Takarani. Well, uh, it's, this is a question that pertains to the larger issue of the existence of evil in this material world. Why does evil exist? That's a very common philosophical question asked across the world from since time immemorial. And Srila Prabhupada uh, answers this question um, very succinctly with a beautiful metaphor or an analogy. He says, imagine that uh, one is standing facing the sun, then everything is brightly illuminated. Now, however, if we stand with our back to the sun and we look down, we see the darkness of our own shadow. So even in the presence of the sun, there is some darkness there because I've turned my back to the sun. So similarly, where there is Krishna, there is uh, light, there is knowledge, there is love, there is everything auspicious and positive. However, when we turn our back to Krishna, so to speak, at that time, uh, we get preoccupied with the darkness of ignorance. So, uh, Krishna Surya Sama Maya Hoy Andakar Jaha Krishna Taha Nahi Maya Adhikar. So, in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, we are told that Krishna is like the sun, Maya is like darkness. Where there is Krishna, there can be no Maya. The darkness of Maya cannot exist. So, by darkness here, I mean all forms of evil that may stem from. Uh, anything else, any any negative thing, anything devoid of Krishna consciousness. So therefore, to answer the question, hatred and evil do not exist in Krishna because Krishna is the absolute truth. Therefore, he is all good. Everything about Krishna is all good. So even if he's angry, that's all good. If he kills, that's all good. Everything is a manifestation of his love and his supreme transcendental nature. So hate and such negative emotions are experienced by the conditioned souls when they turn their back to Krishna. So it has no existence in the uh, absolute world in the way that we understand here. Because the emotions in the conditioned state are perverted reflections of the pure emotions in the spiritual world. So therefore, the negatives of hate and so on are found in the spiritual world and in Krishna in the pure form of love and so on. Thank you, Maharaj, that makes sense. Um, got one question that's come in from uh, Dr. Paul, Paul Bimal. Uh, Panchasara. He says, Maharaj, it's very difficult to do anything selflessly. I try, but I fail. As with the material energy uh, um, and modes working on us, it becomes difficult to leap the fruits of our activities and do things selflessly, even for family members. There are always expectations like recognition of our efforts or appreciation. If that doesn't happen, then anger, greed, envy starts infiltrating the mind. How to become selfless? Good question. First and foremost, it's a good question. First and foremost, by understanding what the word uh, self means and what the word selfish really means. Uh, if one is in the bodily concept of life, then everything one does is essentially selfish. From a material point of view, one may act in a selfless way in the sense that one may try to do good to others. Um, sometimes that may be out of a desire for prestige and name and fame as a charitable person, or it may be because one does it to feel good. One feels good when one does good for others. It makes one feel worthwhile that I'm doing something really good. 
So uh, ultimately, uh, because such uh, activities for helping others are on the material platform, they are devoid of the right understanding of what true welfare really is. So when we understand the nature of the true self as being the Atma, the soul, then everything we do will uh, be on the spiritual platform or be connected to the spiritual platform in some way or will assist oneself and others to eventually come to that spiritual platform. So uh, that's the first point. Uh, the second point is that this is our real uh, benefit. The Sanskrit word is called Svartha, Sva and Artha. Sva means self, Artha means benefit in this context. So Svartha in normal usage can mean selfish, which has a negative connotation. But when we understand the word self to mean the soul and devotional service to Krishna as the ultimate Svartha or the real benefit for the self, and we dovetail our activities in Krishna consciousness, for the benefit of oneself and others, then that activity can also be considered selfless. Because one is actually doing it for the pleasure of Krishna. Or one should aspire to do it for the pleasure of Krishna. And the more one sincerely serves Krishna in the association of devotees, the more one will um, develop this selfless mood. So th there has to be that very strong conviction that Krishna consciousness is the ultimate welfare work for all living entities. And one accepts that in one's life and then one tries to, to distribute this message and the process to others also. Then one automatically becomes selfless by engaging in selfless activities. And one can always introspect if one is doing an activity which is essentially supposed to be selflessly done, but if we have some ulterior motive behind it, like wanting some name and fame or prestige or position of something, then we should be honest enough as devotees to introspect and see that this is not the way it should be. So by such course correction internally, by introspection and by sincerity, sincerity, one can move on the path of selflessness. But selflessness does not mean only working for the spiritual welfare of others and uh, denying oneself the spiritual benefit. In other words, one should not uh, stop one's own spiritual practices in order to help other spiritual practices. To give a very simple example, in order to help others chant Hare Krishna, I should not stop chanting Hare Krishna myself and doing my japa and spend all my time giving Krishna consciousness to others and I don't get time to chant my own japa. So that, that form of selflessness will not last too long. So what is necessary for me to give to others is also necessary for me to do myself. So if I remain steadfast in my own spiritual practices, then I will be in a better position to selflessly give it out to others. You often there's this, this concept, um, especially in the modern day, of, of being selfish to be selfless. That seems to be quite a common concept now, self-care. Oh, is that so? Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> um, Marsh, have you got time for one more question? Just to, until we. I can even go on. I can even go on for a few more minutes. I have no problem. We can stay. There are oh, more okay, questions. Okay, thank you. Okay, we don't, we don't want to be selfish and, and take your time too much. But um, uh, we've got one question here about um, this verse in the Bhagavad Gita. So Krishna says that he reciprocates according to how we approach him. So this person who's anonymous is saying, why can't we do the same thing? Why can't we reciprocate with people how they approach us? Like say somebody is, is not very nice to us. Why can't we uh, deride them in return? <laughs> so why can't the we uh, reciprocate answer, with people? The simple answer is because we are not Krishna. And number one, and that needs some explanation. 
when Krishna says that he reciprocates according to how we deal with him, we should know that every act that Krishna does, whether it's an act of uh, reciprocation to our action or whether it is an act that he does of his own accord, are both for our welfare. Because Krishna is all merciful, he is all knowing, and he is all powerful. Therefore, everything that Krishna does with respect to us is for our benefit. So even if he reciprocates exactly the way we act towards him, and he uh, act, reacts in the same coin, then even that is for our benefit. But that is not the case when we deal with others. When we say that we will reciprocate with others in the way that they deal with us, uh, we are not acting for the other person's benefit. In some cases, that may be so. Uh, but most of the time, it is not so. So we may react out of ego or out of hatred or something like that. But Krishna never reacts out of ego or hatred or anything negative. So because we have negative emotions, anarthas, unwanted things in our heart, and we need to purify them, therefore, one of the theaters or one of the platforms on which we have to act to purify ourselves of these bad habits and tendencies is our dealings with others. So therefore, our scriptures, including the Bhagavatam, the Chaitanya Charitamrita, Bhagavad Gita, they teach us what qualities we should aspire to develop. And these qualities, are we get an opportunity to develop these qualities in our relationships with others. If, for example, when we are humble, it's only when we deal with others that we know what, how to be humble or how not to be humble. Similarly, if we want to be kind, then we have to be kind to somebody. So it is in relationships that we, we get an opportunity to develop our Vaishnava qualities. So therefore, we can't follow that same principle. Although sometimes at a practical level, to some degree, that principle is still valid even for us. You know, at a practical, simple level, let's say somebody uh, says we, is avoiding talking to us. I hope such things don't happen, but in case it does, right? And somebody is insistent that he will, he will not talk to us. Well, what can you do? You can't just force that person to talk to you. So you say, all right, if, what can I do? So then you stay away from that person because that person wants you to be away from him. So, okay. So there may be some times when we may follow this principle, but essentially the guiding point is that what is beneficial for us to develop Vaishnava qualities and what is beneficial for the other person. These are the two guiding principles based on which we should act in this world with respect to others. Very nice, Maharaj. Thank you for that answer. Um, okay, we've got another question about um, Lord Chaitanya. Someone's questioning whether he's a saint or an avatar. So I'll just read the question. Um, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came in the disguise of a devotee of Sri Krishna. When he himself is Krishna, as revealed in different verses of the scriptures. When all of these scriptures have been read by other paramparas, what makes them believe that he is a pure saint and a devotee, not Krishna? So he's asking, if it's, is it sufficient that we understand him as a saint? Um, like, would it, would it be wrong if we just regard him as a saint, a saint? Would we get any lesser result than these other sampradayas? And that's from uh, Raghavendra Nayak. Well, it is true that it is mostly the Gaudiya Sampradaya that understands that Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is directly the Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna. Other Sampradayas, uh, Vaishnava Sampradayas, uh, may or may not accept that. 
some Vaishnav Sampradaya may accept him as a Lord and some may just consider him a saint. Now, it's important to understand this issue in the context of what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has come here to give. Generally, um, even if they are Vaishnav Sampradayas, they are mostly uh, dealing with bhakti that is in the mood of Vaikuntha, of Lord Narayan and his consort Lakshmi Devi. Or maybe uh, Ayodhya of Lord Sri Ramachandra and Sita Devi, perhaps. Or to some extent, maybe even Dwarka, for example. But Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has come to specifically give us the love of Vrindavan, which is a very, very special kind of love of Godhead, not found anywhere else except in Vrindavan. So uh, when we understand what the nature of that specific love is, then we'll understand the identity of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has, to, has come in the guise of a devotee, in the mood and the complexion of Srimati Radharani, because he's exhibiting that exalted, super exalted state of separation that Srimati Radharani feels towards Krishna. So it's not an ordinary thing at all. And certainly we cannot uh, become anywhere close to Srimati Radharani but we simply aspire to be atoms, specks of dust at the lotus feet of her followers, right? So this is our understanding. So uh, when, we, when we worship Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, we are actually worshiping Radha Krishna. And it is through Chaitanya Mahaprabhu that we get entrance into the divine esoteric mysteries of Vrindavan. And without Mahaprabhu's uh, mercy, it is very hard to do that. So if someone is simply a worshipper of Krishna, but does not worship Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, technically, if that person becomes a pure devotee, then uh, he may go to the Vaikuntha world, the world of Lord Narayan. If someone worships Krishna in the mood of Vrindavan, but without understanding Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he may go only to uh, Krishna Loka or Goloka Vrindavan. But as Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur has explained, that if someone is a worshipper of both Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Krishna, by worshipper of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, uh, he means here understanding him to be none other than Radha Krishna then that devotee will simultaneously exist after he or she is liberated and goes back to the spiritual world, will simultaneously exist in Goloka Vrindavan and in Navadvip in the spiritual world. Will participate in both pastimes, be simultaneously present in both the dhams in the spiritual world. So technically, yes, if somebody is following a bona fide Vaishnava Sampradaya, is getting proper guidance from there and becomes a pure devotee of the Lord, actually, then uh, that devotee will or may get access to the spiritual world. But this is a special feature of becoming a follower of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu with the understanding that he is none other than uh, Krishna in the mood of Srimati Radharani. Wonderful. Thank you, Maharaj. We have a, a very, very similar, not similar question, but a related question on this topic. Um, this is from Nirat Shet, who says, the gopis didn't know Krishna is the Supreme Lord. Was that the reason that they loved him? If they knew that he was the Supreme Lord, would they have Vaikuntha Bhav? Okay, the gopis loved Krishna and they sometimes knew that Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead and sometimes they didn't. Their knowledge of Krishna's Godhood arose only occasionally and there is evidence to that 
effect in the verses of the 10th canto where they address the lord as uh, krishna as the supreme lord as the one who is seated in the heart of everybody as the one who is worshipped by the yogis and so on so there were times when they knew it but this knowledge of krishna's godhood which is aishwarya gyan aishwarya means opulence gyan means knowledge so aishwarya gyan refers to the knowledge of krishna's opulence which means knowing krishna as a supreme personality of godhead now this aishwarya gyan even if it arose and as and when it arose in the hearts of the gopis in vrindavan was very quickly eclipsed or overwhelmed by the madhurya gyan madhurya gyan is a knowledge of krishna's sweetness which has no a consideration of the godhood of krishna in the madhurya gyan conception krishna is only a lovable cowherd boy in vrindavan so by and large this is the conception of the gopis and even when the aishwarya gyan arose in their hearts still the madhurya gyan was very much there they did not stop loving krishna in the way that they did otherwise also so this is the special feature of vrindavan that when the aishwarya gyan comes up on occasion the madhurya gyan doesn't go away it remains but for devotees outside vrindavan even in mathura for example like vasudev and devaki when they saw the uh, overwhelming strength of krishna in killing kamsa and so on they lost their sweetness of parental love for krishna and they were struck with wonder and their mood became reverential so that madhurya gyan was covered over by the aishwarya gyan because they were outside of vrindavan so in vrindavan the special feature is that madhurya gyan is always predominant regardless of whether aishwarya gyan is there or not on the contrary the presence of that aishwarya gyan will further embellish and nourish and strengthen that madhurya gyan madhurya gyan so in this respect we see that the gopis uh, love krishna because he was so attractive because he had all the attractive qualities uh it didn't matter to them that he was a supreme lord it is just that he was so attractive so they loved him among the gopis there were those who are eternal associates who came from goloka vrindavan the spiritual world along with him they descended here into this vrindavan performed the past times along with him and returned to goloka along with him or so they're unmanifest form they're still doing past times here but in the manifest form they returned whereas there were some gopis who had performed austerities of different devotional austerities of different sorts at different times and places and they got the opportunity after many many lifetimes of devotional service in the mood of vrindavan following in the footsteps of the gopis to become a gopi to be be born from a gopi's womb in vrindavan when krishna had bent it so they also had the opportunity to participate in these pastimes and they got trained by the other nitkasiddha gopis so they they got this opportunity to be born as gopis in vrindavan because their love for krishna transcended the aishwarya gyan it went beyond the understanding of krishna as a supreme personality of godhead but for us who are struggling with the three modes of material nature it is important to have this aishwarya gyan to start with and to continue with it for a long long time otherwise it will become sahajya it will become taking the process of krishna consciousness very cheaply so we become fixed in all the philosophical aspects of bhagavad gita and shrimad bhagavatam and so on and simultaneously we try to develop that that love for krishna which is very sweet we try to appreciate the residence of vrindavan and the past times of krishna in vrindavan and we cultivate the mood of vrindavan so in this why? way we follow in their footsteps yeah but why is it that aishwarya leads to sweetness like what is the connection between the two what why is it that by practicing something or a reverence that that would lead to the higher the higher level 
Why does Aishwarya lead to sweetness, you mean for us as practicing devotees? Yes. Because presently, our main issue is that we are not attracted to Krishna. We are attracted to the material world. So we have to overcome that material attraction, uh, transcend the three modes of material nature by understanding the philosophical truths of the scriptures and fix our mind in the process of devotional service by virtue of which we will eventually get more and more attracted to Krishna. And as we become more and more attracted to Krishna, then we become aware and we experience his sweetness. That is when our initial understanding is, it, it uh, matures into a more sweeter understanding of Krishna. So those who, have siddha, those who have come to participate in Krishna's pastime, whether as gopis or as coward boys or anything else, they have in their previous many lives in the material world performed devotional service, starting with uh, simple devotional service, service to the devotees, service to Krishna even unknowingly sometimes. And that is accumulated over years. And then they have surrendered to Krishna, they have become pure devotees, and then they have got the chance to do that. So this is how the things move up. Unless, of course, one is exceptionally fortunate and one comes in touch with a devotee and uh, a pure devotee of the Lord and one immediately, instantaneously is blessed with that sweet love of Vrindavan, Kripa Siddhi, but that is very, very rare. One will have to go through the struggles of understanding the philosophy of going through the motions of doing our sadhana sincerely and everything else. Purifying the heart, struggling against the mind and the senses. So we have to go through that purificatory process. Without which the attraction for the sweetness of Krishna cannot arise. Thank you, Maharaj. Um, I'm, I'm aware that it's getting a bit late in India, so we won't take any more of your time, but we're just we're so grateful that you've agreed to do this session today. We've had so many questions through. We've actually flooded, we can't get through them all today. Um, so um, yeah, if, if you'd like to see viewers, if you'd like to see another session like this, please uh, let us know. You can, you can message or you can um, comment on this video. Um, but otherwise, yeah, just thank you so much, Marge. It's been a, been a wonderful session. And um, please stay tuned for more like this, hopefully. Any closing words, Marge? No, thank you all very much. And uh, I'm sorry that I could not answer everybody's questions because naturally time is limited. And uh, maybe we can have another session at some point. And those questions which, which could not be uh, asked today can be asked. You can hold them. Uh, and ask them next time. Maybe then I can serve the other devotees whose questions have not been answered. So meanwhile, I hope that all of you are well and safe and uh, that the coronavirus situation in your place, wherever you are, is in control. Do continue to take your precautions. And I hope that your Krishna consciousness is also progressing nicely. Thank you very much.